Beautiful leather, good brand, great customer service, hand lasted. Where'd it go wrong? How are you going? My name is Tech and welcome back to my channel Bootlosophy. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands I live and work on, the Wajit people. Now I've been doing a few videos lately on how some of my boots have worn uh, over the last few years, being that I started collecting boots in earnest uh, only since March of 2020. Today I'm looking at these Oak Street Bootmakers trench boots. Now I have a story about this pair. Uh, I bought my first pair of Oak Street Bootmakers in November of 2021. Their influential makeup of cap toe, natural chrome excel, on a leather sole, and I loved them. You can see my uh, review up here. In the meantime, my boot collecting frenzy, <laughs> I admit it, was really ramping up and I uh, bought five or six pairs of Parkhurst boots by then and was in love with that brand because of their 602 last, which really fit my feet. I really wanted their Richmond Capto boot in natural Dublin, but I kept missing out. As Parkhurst are uh, small batch manufacturers, every time they did a drop, I'd buy a pair that was in an uh, interesting leather. Then I couldn't afford the Natty Dub, or often I was too slow and I couldn't get it in my size. Anyway, over 2020 and 2021, Parkhurst was having COVID production issues and didn't produce a Natty Dub, although they did do a Color 8 Dublin, which you can see up here. To cut a long story short, while I was waiting for Parkhurst to make the Natty Dub again, Oak Street Bootmakers released this trench boot in November of 2022 in the Natural Dublin, and since I loved the original trench boot, and it was a Black Friday sale, I clicked on the button. When it arrived, I found two immediately noticeable things. The first was how much wider it felt than the original, in the same size. The second was this wavy split reverse welt at the toe. I wrote to them and in a to and fro exchange, they said that they thought I'd actually got one of the first, if not the first, hand lasted pairs and that they were slowly changing all their makeups to being hand lasted. I think they uh, pretty much all are now, but at that time, they hadn't even changed their website to announce it. <laughs> now, back up a bit. This is a Goodyear welted boot and I'll talk about that in a minute. But previously, Oak Street Bootmakers Factory, I actually think it was the same one making the trench boot uh, as the one making Parkhurst's boots in Batavia, New York. That factory used mechanical lasting machines. You may have seen videos of similar machines where the worker uh, wraps the uppers over a last and then feeds it into a machine where a row of mechanical fingers kind of uh, pull the leather over the last and then tighten it. So you'd expect that uh, the pressure applied was consistent. In hand lasting, it's not only more laborious, but the hand pressure could be different on each boot. The plus is that it takes skill and you get a more handmade boot than that lasted by a machine. The negative, of course, if you want to see it as a negative, is that there are variations from pair to pair and sometimes even from left to right in a pair. If you want perfectly symmetrical boots, then that's a negative, I guess. I don't mind. I like the imperfection of the handmade product. I think it shows the character of a handmade product, in my opinion anyway. Uh, like the difference between the dark, almost monochromatic colors in the Mona Lisa and a paint by numbers kit of the Mona Lisa. Which is also why, as an aside, I think many people complain that Pacific Northwest boots have lost their quality control. I think that at least uh, two reasons may have combined to provide that opinion on social media. First, my understanding is that uh, they, they did lose experienced workers to retirement and they're finding it difficult to replace them. I think the second reason may be the popularity of heritage boots and a lot of people new to heritage, handmade boots, they're being drawn to buying them and when they receive them, compare the, the rugged unfinished look uh, the kind of wayward hand stitching to what they're used to in precisely mechanically made Timberlands and Doc Martens and similar boots. Be that as it may, how about these boots? 
Firstly, they're called the trench boot, modeled after the two World Wars uh, military boots, about six inches high in the shaft, uh, Derby open lacing system, brass hardware, cap toe, uh, two-piece backstay, uh, set on a flat outsole and a low block heel. The iconic military service boot. In my case, I've added a matching kilty from uh, Dale's Leatherworks because I found the fit a bit loose and I wanted to bark it up a bit, but more of that later. Oak Street bootmakers have been around since 2010, founded by son of a cobbler, George Vlagos. In my review of the Natural Chrome XL trench boot, I told a story that's worth retelling, I think. The rawhide laces that came with those uh, were, were very long. Uh, I now know that they're meant to wrap around your ankle. I didn't know it then, so I cut them short. <laughs> Not being able to tie them snugly enough, I went back on their website and I ordered another pair. When they arrived, there were two pairs of laces and a note that said that they thought my one pair would be lonely on such a long journey to Australia, so they gave me another one for free. I cannot get past this human touch of humour and thoughtfulness and exemplary customer service. Today, they offer a wide range of Goodyear welted shoes, loafers and moccasins, as well as a great curation of boots. They offer uh, three basic styles of boots. Their famous trench boot, their field boots, and their lakeshore boots, each with a varying degree of dressiness. These styles can be bought as uh, either plain toe or cap toe, and in a variety of outdoor options, uh, leather, day night, commando, and with really quite a stunning variety of leathers. They also offer limited editions of these shoes and boots in some specialty leathers. I'll put a link to their website in the description area down below. Now, from what I've seen, and I haven't clicked on every single item on their website, all their boots are now hand lasted, which uh, due to the expertise required and the labor intensiveness is reflected in the price, which I'll get to. They're all uh, 360 degree Goodyear welted, but with different welts, either a split reverse welt or a flat welt. Goodyear welting is, a, a, is one form of constructing heritage footwear, and, and you can see the four main types of construction in this video up here. A thin leather strip, called the welt, is sewn all the way around the perimeter of the boot. On the uh, inside, they're sewn to the uppers and insole, and on the outside, they're sewn through to the outsole. In this way, the boot is more water resistant than some of the other methods, because the stitch holes don't go all the way through. Uh, the welt sort of forms a barrier. It's also resolable when uh, your outsole wears out. You don't have to throw it away like cement constructed shoes. Your cobbler uh, can peel off the outsole, he cuts the stitches basically and peels off the outsole and then glues and stitches on a new one uh, and to make your boot you know, last decades. In this case, the sole construction is made up of a day-night outsole, a, uh, a rubber studded outsole made by the UK Harbour Rubber Company, famous for making their day-night studded soles, as well as the wavy lugged Ridgeway sole. This is a full slip rubber sole that goes the whole length of the boot under the leather heel stack, which is then topped with a rubber heel. Uh, the rubber outsole is stitched to the four or five millimeter thick leather midsole and then to the split reverse welt. The split reverse welt is a welt where it's split halfway and one edge is kind of like peeled up and then pushed against the uppers, reinforcing that water resistance. Inside the boot, the welt, which is about three or four mils thick, forms a cavity in the middle as, it, as the welt circles the boot. This cavity is filled with cork by this brand and inserted into the cork between the heel and the ball of the foot is, I believe, a fiberglass shank. They have moved around uh, between fiberglass, steel and even leather shanks, so I'm not sure what this particular pair has in there. Oh, a, a shank, by the way, is what stops your arch sinking into this gap and it helps with keeping you stable when you're walking over uneven ground, uh, stopping the boot from twisting laterally. The insole on the inside is also leather, and then there's a leather half sock liner at the heel for added comfort and to protect you against the nails uh, in the heel. The uppers of this pair are from Horween Tannery in Chicago, the famed makers of Chrome Excel and Shell Cordovan. Uh, Dublin is the second stage of one of their veg tan leathers, starting as a straight veg tan Essex leather and then getting some uh, waxes included to become Dublin and finally finishing off with more oils and waxes 
and becomes derby leather. The Dublin leather, despite having the introduction of waxes, is quite dry and it retains a lot of veg tan characteristics. It is a little stiff, especially in this two and a half millimeter thick form. It's a little squeaky. It creases a fair amount and not in a fine sugary break either. Uh, in this natural color, it scuffs easily. Some would say uh, adding to the patina. Uh, the boot is lined with leather in the vamp, but it's unlined in the shaft. It uses a firm leather heel counter, but I think uh, the toe puff is elastic because it has that give. Uh, that toe cap is not real. It's a toe cap piece sewn onto the cut off vamp. But now let's get to the catch up. As I say, I've had this for a couple of years, but to be honest, I haven't worn it a great deal. Now, don't twist my arm to say how much I've worn it. Uh, certainly in the early days, I probably wore it for at least once a week because I love the color of this leather. Uh, you can check my Instagram account back then to see how often they appeared because I really like this natural Dublin orange and the ruggedness of the look. But look, let's be honest, with so many pairs of boots, they haven't had two years worth of wear. Uh, but enough though, I think, to, to gauge how they've worn because they are definitely broken in. Let's start with comfort. Probably the biggest issue I have is the sizing and the lasting. The Elston last, on which this is made, is a wide toe last anyway. Even in my better fitting pair in the natural chrome XL, uh, the toe box is roomy, but it's not loose. In this pair, the same size, it is very loose. I take that to be because of the hand lasting. The pressure to pull the leather over the last was not perhaps as firm and consistent as by a machine. In my interview with Andrew Savisco of Parkhurst, which you can watch up there, uh, Andrew did say that a different factory will use different pressure. So I guess a human hand even more so. Oak Street Bootmakers says to size true to size, which I did in my original trench boot. And I found it to be nicely snug in the back foot uh, and nicely roomy in the front. While I size the same in these boots, I believe I could have gone a half down. That apart, if you were to wear uh, thick boot socks, then you know, this is fine. The addition of a kilty does beef it up a bit so that it's not as loose in the instep and in the ankle. Despite being broken in, there remains a tiny heel slip, I think because it's a tiny bit loose on me. Uh, underfoot, it's comfortable and the layers of uh, you know, rubber, leather, cork and leather is very shock absorbing and the layers of natural materials have settled down under my feet to make it very comfortable to stand around in. Uh, the uppers, I feel to be malleable, but remaining a little stiff, uh, especially around the shaft. And so I do feel a little extra pressure around the collar where it's reinforced by a second strip of that Dublin leather. Another reason for the kilty is the short tongue. The tongue, actually stops a little below the collar, even slipping during wear a little below the last eyelet, which makes the collar area again a little uncomfortable. In terms of patina, I can't complain. The natural Dublin is a full grain leather, showing off the animal's natural scars, uh, pores, um, follicles, scratches, and so in this uh, state, the finish is a natural patina machine. Despite my not wearing this all that much, you can see the variation that has developed overlaid with the odd scratch and scuff in my very casual office and everyday wear. Imagine if I wore them more and did more, you know, hiking or wearing them working in the garden or on a carpentry project or something like that. I love them for that and don't pull them on more often because of the sizing issue. In terms of QC, I think I pointed out the wrinkly toe area in my original review, which you can see up here to compare with now. That's the hand lasting. I may have also pointed out that the welt ends are not skived uh, to fit together nicely. You can see the ends clearly up uh, at different angles. But neither faults have got any worse. Nothing has split apart or gap got wider with use. The layers in the heels and sole construction have all stayed stuck together. And there are some loose ends of stitches here and there. Uh, nothing you can't just burn off. But importantly, no stitch has become unraveled. The QC finish overall, I would say, is not perfect, but it's fine for what is essentially a rugged boot and not a dress boot. To finish off this video, let's look at long-term value. I bought these in a Black Friday sale for US $389. Uh, 
uh, they were listed at the time at US $508. So you'll agree, I think it was a good sale price. I can't see a natural Dublin cap toe trench boot available at the moment on your website. But uh, Chrome XL models with a day-night sole are $498. So much in the ballpark that the ball could actually hit you. I don't believe I'd buy a pair of these in any makeup at the $500 level, just because I equate quality and materials of these with say, uh, Grant Stone or Parkhurst, or even a better made pair of Truman boots, all of which you can get for less, or in the case of Truman, about the same price. I get that they're hand lasted and the others, Truman included now I think, are not. And yes, uh, maybe that deserves a premium. But I think when you're spending at that US $500 level, you think twice and you kind of trade off what your heart tells you versus what your wallet tells you. However, if on sale, and they sometimes are, in fact they often are, uh, either for occasions like Black Friday or end of line type sales when they go for the mid 400s, I would be very tempted to grab a pair. Uh, I'd be in a dilemma though, since they're all hand lasted, do I buy a half size down or stay true to size? Uh, or has the making of these settled down so that I can remain true to size? So in summary, I like them, but I don't love them just because it's a slightly sloppy fit. I like and respect the brand, but I'd wait for a sale. The quality is good, not perfect. I teased at the beginning, where did it go wrong? It hasn't gone wrong, not really, but it hasn't lived up to my higher expectation from the original trench boot that I bought. Not because of any decline quality or anything like that, just my uh, personal attraction to it is a bit less. If you have a pair of these or a newer hand lasted pair, I'd love it if you tell me what you think, especially about their sizing. In any case, I hope you like this review and if you did, Hell, even if you didn't, but you like my channel generally, you know what to do, please click on like. And if you haven't subscribed yet, come on, click on subscribe, yeah? <laughs> I'll be back next week with more boot reviews that dig deep, that get into the real pros and cons, and sometimes with some philosophy of the boot and the brand. So don't miss out. Take care and see you again soon.